I do have some disclosures uh, listed on the slide here, both in the area of growth hormone and of uh, human and other mitochondrial peptides. Uh, I think that topic that never seems to go away when we think about growth hormone uh, is the question whether or not there are long-term risks, whether we have to be concerned about growth hormone excess and mortality or the increased frequency of various diseases. And in this uh, slide, which can be somewhat annoying, you can see that it's generally thought that uh, excess growth hormone can lead to cancer, possibly diabetes, and increased oxidative stress, while growth hormone deficiency can uh, contribute to poor body composition, osteoporosis, and uh, potentially neurodegeneration. And getting the balance right is obviously key. There's uh, a lot of controversy around whether or not survivors uh, uh, or, or recipients of growth hormone are at increased risk. The SAGE results uh, still remains to be fully analyzed. Last year, we had a consensus workshop, which is now in press, that is reassuring regarding long-term safety of growth hormone, but it's certainly not definitive, and there's more to think about. Uh, some papers I'd like to share. Uh, first is uh, a paper from a few years ago on adult height, which uh, we can believe is a surrogate for the growth hormone IGF system, and the risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, particularly uh, in Japan, where it's been shown that shorter people have increased incidence of stroke, uh, perhaps explaining some of the outcomes in uh, studies like SAGE. At the same time, in uh, this meeting a couple of days ago, a uh, Karolinska group reported that taller people have an increased risk of cancer. And I think that falls within the general understanding of the role of the growth hormone. One of the uh, conditions that may be able to tell us more about long-term risk of growth hormone or growth hormone deficiency or the benefits of having low growth hormone is Laron syndrome or growth hormone receptor deficiency. And here you can see uh, Jaime Guevara, who has spoken in this forum before. Uh, about 30 years ago, he was a young man then. And here's a group of Laron dwarfs from Ecuador. The same folks, uh, about 25 years later, you can see that they look really good. Jaime has aged quite a bit. Um, so we had an opportunity to collaborate with Jaime and with Walter Longo, who is now my colleague at USC. Uh, and looked at 100 Laron's patients and 1,000 controls. Laron's patients have uh, very low IGF-1 as well as low IGF-2. And the question we wanted to see is, first of all, do they have different incidence of various diseases? And here you can see in first degree uh, relatives, uh, uh, obligatory heterozygous versus homozygous for the receptor mutation, that there is, in fact, a different profile of disease incidence, with the most dramatic difference being uh, essentially zero cancers in the patients and uh, almost no diabetes or no diabetes in the patient group compared to their uh, relatives. However, they do have an increased incidence of other uh, conditions, particularly convulsive disorders and alcoholism. And the lack of cancer as well as diabetes is particularly interesting in the face of this uh, increased prevalence of obesity. Uh, nevertheless, there is no cancer at all. And one would uh, presume that the possible uh, decrease in diabetes is a result that in spite of the uh, obesity, there is improved insulin sensitivity in these patients. So they do have a different profile of diseases. But the remarkable thing in this paper was that we have shown that the actual mortality, survival, and life expectancy in Laron dwarfs in Ecuador is completely similar to their uh, first degree relatives. So these patients don't live longer as one might have expected, knowing that in the mouse models of Laron syndrome, the growth hormone receptor knockout mouse, these mice do live substantially longer. So 
at least in humans, it appears that having uh, growth hormone uh, deficiency or a lack of action does not confer a major survival advantage. To look at it in another way, uh, together with uh, my colleague Nir Barzilai at Einstein, we wanted to see if people who've reached exceptional longevity uh, or centenarians have a different profile suggesting that their IGF system is somehow altered. And you can see that while we didn't see that in males, females who are daughters of centenarians have higher IGF-1 levels, but they have shorter stature. And this is reminiscent of IGF insensitivity or uh, like the mouse model of the IGF-1 receptor knockout mouse that has been shown to be small, to have elevated IGF-1 levels, and to be long-lived. And it's not that hard to make mice live longer than control mice. Uh, it's much trickier to do it for people. So we've studied uh, over 100, uh, uh, by, uh, at this point, centenarians and 160 controls, and we've identified that female centenarians and their daughters have an increased incidence of variations in the IGF-1 receptor gene uh, that contribute uh, uh, to their longevity and are associated with shorter stature and, uh, and IGF resistance, although in a very small number. We then uh, looked in the same centenarian population to look at the growth hormone receptor to see if particular variations uh, confer uh, longevity. And one particular variation that appeared to be important is the D3 growth hormone receptor deletion, um, which is quite common, was first described to be uh, related to uh, response to growth hormone and ISS. In the population of centenarians, carriers of the D3 GHR mutations appear to have lower IGF-1 levels and to be shorter, suggesting that they somehow have reduced growth hormone action that's possibly associated with reduced growth hormone secretion as a result of a feedback mechanism. But importantly, if you look at in this uh, population of Ashkenazi Jews, uh, including the centenarians, the frequency of the D3 variation, it goes up with age from age 50 to 100. And what that indicates is that it confers some sort of a selection advantage over time, and then people who have this mutation are more likely to make it to 100. We then look in a second population of old uh, order Amish, and they also have a rising frequency of this uh, variation over time, suggesting, again, that a reduced growth hormone activity may be associated with a higher likelihood of being a centenarian. But if you compare that to some of the other genes that have been linked to longevity, for example, the adiponectin gene, where a variation in uh, th this uh, important hormone is dramatically associated with an increased uh, chance of being a centenarian, as well as this HDL variant that's associated with uh, long life, you can see that the contribution of IGF-1 receptor is minimal, and even the growth hormone receptor is not dramatic. So yes, centenarians do offer a clue that maybe there's some relationship with the growth hormone IGF system, but it's not necessarily a key one. So I think one, one of the areas that over the last decade we've noticed is even more important in terms of confirming, uh, conferring an opportunity to live a longer life is diet. And particularly what kind of diet is important in preventing disease and allowing for longevity has been an incredibly complicated story. And one of the things that people have been focusing on in the last few years is whether or not a diet changes your body composition, whether you gain weight with the diet. And here are two mice, uh, and you can see that this one is clearly a little bit rotund. This one is a very fit mouse. And one of them is on a low protein diet, and one of them is on a low carb diet, and one of them lives longer than the other. 
And guess which mouse lives longer? To our surprise, this mouse that clearly has what we would consider an undesirable body composition actually had increased lifespan, the low protein mouse, why mouse that had a low carb diet didn't live longer. In fact, uh, they had reduced longevity compared to uh, an ad lib diet. And the main reason for this increased longevity in the low protein diet is very similar to what you might see in a Larone mouse, is the ability to delay or prevent uh, tumors. And it's associated, this low protein diet is associated with lower IGF-1. So the low IGF-1 that's derived by appropriate diets may actually confer longevity, at least in mice. And we wanted to see if the same holds true for humans. So we analyzed this uh, health and retirement study. There are about 20,000 people here who we have complete medical information on, including IGF-1 levels and dietary history. So you can see that people that eat high protein diets versus those who eat low protein diets have differences in their IGF-1 levels, and protein is a major determinant of IGF-1. We then looked at people under 65, which were followed all the way to death, and looked whether or not uh, there is an increase of all-cause CVD and cancer mortality in individuals who eat moderate protein versus high protein as compared to the low protein standard here, which is at one. And you can see that high protein diets associated with a low IGF-1 do lead to an increased risk of all cause mortality and a pretty substantial risk of developing cancer. And it wouldn't have been what I would have guessed 10 years ago. The interesting thing is that once you reach the age of 65, you actually do need to eat a lot of protein to keep yourself healthy and maintain uh, uh, survival and avoid morbidity. Now, the concept that low IGF-1 or high IGF-1 may not be good for you has been first uh, proposed about a decade ago when an analysis of the NHANES study, which is another uh, thousands and thousands of people rich study, all of these had IGF-1 levels. And while this curve is not dramatic, it significantly shows that the best IGF-1 level to have in order to guarantee the longest possible lifespan is somewhere in the middle. And certainly high IGF-1, but also very low IGF-1s are associated with increased mortality. This has been replicated by several other studies, including this Swedish study, uh, which is a branch of the international study known as Mr. Oss where these investigators demonstrated that both in terms of all-cause mortality, cancer mortality, and cardiovascular events, there is a sweet spot somewhere in the middle for IGF-1, which is associated with the lowest possible mortality, and neither a very high IGF-1 or very low IGF-1 is beneficial. And here you can see actual survival of people in this study, and the green are the people in the middle, and the blue and the red are the high and the low IGF-1 quintiles, respectively. And you can see that both for cancer and cardiovascular disease, the lowest number of events are for people in the middle of the range. And I think that uh, data continue to confirm now that you don't want your IGF-1 to go up, that associated with various risk, but you also don't want to reduce it too much. In fact, the biggest thing in the IGF world about a decade ago was the attempt to develop molecules or drugs that block IGF-1 activity. And the furthest alone was a group of antibodies against the IGF-1 receptor, which uh, were tested in phase three clinical studies. In this particular phase three study, which was a breast cancer study, uh, patients were randomized to either uh, control, placebo, or this IGF-1 receptor antibody. And in fact, those patients who had the IGF-1 receptor blocked died more. So the concept that we'd be able to make people live longer by blocking IGF-1 did not pan out. On the other hand, a dietary study, and I think you're all familiar with the famous Mediterranean diet study 
uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine six years ago. This is a diet that's associated with both low IGF-1 levels and low insulin levels, is also associated with reduced mortality and particularly reduced cardiovascular events. And it might be that low IGF-1 is not beneficial unless it's also associated with reduced insulin level, which uh, diet can clearly uh, lead to. So obviously the point of many lectures that I've given in the past has been how this takes us to IGF-based dosing and why that makes sense when we treat patients with growth hormone. Uh, I'm not gonna belabor the point today. I think there are many reasons why growth hormone treated patients should be uh, applied uh, for this approach, which is clinically feasible, it may help with growth outcome, but most importantly, it may actually optimize the cost-benefit ratio in uh, growth hormone therapy. It uh, protects from the theoretical concerns of high IGF-1, and thus is a major safety assurance strategy for growth hormone therapy. And I'll just show one slide related to that uh, in this study that we conducted that randomized patients to either a fixed dose of growth hormone at 40 microgram per kilogram per day, or to titration of the IGF-1 to the mean uh, for the age and gender of the population. And you can see that if you look at value that you get out of your growth hormone therapy, which is dollars per centimeters, or the delta high SDS divided by the growth hormone dose, which is the dollars, um, you can see that patients who were titrated to the mean uh, had a better value than patients who had a fixed dose, even though there was only a small reduction in dose here and uh, uh, the IGF-1 levels were not really different. At the same time, if you look at the frequency of IGF-1 measurements outside of the normal range or above plus 2 SDS, in the same uh, two populations, you can see that while the mean IGF-1 was indifferent, when patients were titrated to the mean as opposed to having a fixed dose, the number of IGF-1 measurements above plus two was dramatically reduced, suggesting that this titration approach results in potentially better safety. So I've spoken to you for about I don't know, 18 minutes about IGF-1. Uh, but is it all about IGF-1? And clearly, growth hormone regulates many genes uh, in, in various tissues. And one of them that we've started working on uh, in the last decade is called Humanin. And this might be a very interesting and important new uh, molecule to keep in mind when thinking about growth hormone therapy. Uh, Humanin uh, is a mitochondrial-derived peptide. It's encoded from an open reading frame in the 16S region of the mitochondrial chromosome. Uh, it's a 24-amino acid peptide. It's related to longevity and cardiovascular risk. It has anti-Alzheimer's effects, uh, improves insulin sensitivity and protects from diabetes, as well as chemotherapy toxicity, atherosclerosis. Has a pretty well-defined mechanism of action through a cognate receptor, and it activates STOP3 and ERK, for example, to protect neuronal cells uh, from amyloid beta toxicity and uh, to protect uh, ApoE knockout mice uh, from the development of plaques during high fat diet. So it's a pretty potent uh, peptide with protective effects. Um, recently, uh, we've identified a SNP in the mitochondrial chromosome that controls uh, variations in human level. And I've also shown that in African Americans versus Caucasian populations, we see dramatic differences in human levels, suggesting that possibly one of the reasons African Americans are more uh, commonly diagnosed with diabetes and Alzheimer's disease could be uh, this human in connection. And as I said, human in is related to longevity in a number of ways. Here you can see a transgenic worm, uh, C. elegans worm, that overexpresses humanin, lives twice as long as uh, the normal worm. And we've taken uh, mice and treated them with humanin for over a year. And you can see that uh, there is a reduction in weight 
a reduction in IGF-1 and this IGF-1 inhibitory effect, which we call a dietary mimetic effect of humanin, appears to be one of the key mechanisms for its beneficial effects. And these mice that were treated with humanin for a year show improved cognition, reduced metabolic disorders, and really no negative side effects. We've then taken the same population of centenarians we've talked about earlier relating to the role of IGF and growth hormone in longevity and show that uh, in uh, centenarian progeny, human levels are three times higher than in controls, suggesting that it is a key uh, contributor or determinant of longevity in humans. Now, we've always suspected that humanin has uh, major relations with the growth hormone IGF system. We originally cloned humanin as a partner, as a binding partner of IGF BP3, which interacts with BP3 at a different location than IGF1, and in fact is uh, being carried in the high molecular weight 150 Dalton complex with ALS. So we wanted to see whether growth hormone and IGF-1 actually regulate human levels. And in a paper published in Aging Cell last year, we've shown, first of all, that growth hormone transgenic mice, these big guys here, uh, have reduced human levels, uh, and that obviously growth hormone suppresses human in. And growth hormone deficient mice, these are Ames mice, have elevated human in levels, um, compatible with the same uh, relationship. Um, we then took uh, children treated with growth hormone, and before growth hormone treatment is started, you can see that there's an inverse relationship between IGF or IGF 1 SDS and the level of human in, slightly weaker relationship with peak growth hormone. On the other hand, when we start growth hormone therapy on these patients, human levels drop. And conversely, in patients uh, with Laron syndrome, you can see that there's higher levels of human in, in these individuals. Which leads us to this hypothesis that uh, growth hormone through IGF-1 suppresses human in, and that human in is important in uh, prevention of diseases of aging and uh, leads to longevity. And when you balance the various roles of growth hormone in the body, its effects on this system have to be considered in addition to what growth hormone does to IGF-1. And I want to bring in uh, uh, a set of data that uh, Lars Avendal's group in Karolinska has been working on and presenting here at SB over the last three years. Uh, they published a paper last year demonstrating that human in can protect and restore the growth abnormalities associated in this case with the chemotherapy uh, bertuzumab, uh, which induces bone growth impairments. And you can see that uh, the effect of the uh, bone toxin chemotherapy is pretty dramatic. And when you treat mice with chemotherapy and add human in, you can almost completely prevent the growth abnormalities. Uh, and you can also see that in their pictures here of the uh, bone itself. In a separate paper, the same group published data showing, uh, uh, shown data showing that human in prevents the steroids-induced growth disorders uh, uh, associated with uh, various conditions uh, for which we use steroids. So I think together, this allows us to think about human in as a new player in the growth hormone IGF system. Here is a diagram that I uh, had the pleasure of uh, publishing to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of the somatomid and hypothesis together uh, with, with Dr. Kaplan, who's been <clears throat> Mitch's boss when, before Mitch became Mach boss, uh, and, and the cascade of growth hormone research uh, is shown here. But I believe it's time to uh, rewrite uh, the diagram and to consider the fact that uh, growth hormone and metabolism have a new player that needs to be recognized, and that's humanin. 
uh, Humanin, as uh, Lars and colleagues have shown, can correct growth abnormalities associated with inflammatory conditions, chemotherapy, and steroids. And in fact, it's possible that Humanin supplementation may overcome some of the undesirable effects of growth hormone and IGF-1, including uh, risk of cancer and diabetes. So a decade ago, uh, the big uh, uh, new idea in growth science was a combo product of growth hormone plus IGF-1. That didn't go where we were hoping a decade ago. I'd like to propose that perhaps the next combo, the one that might have the right balance, is growth hormone plus humanin. And perhaps uh, in a decade, uh, we'll actually have clinical data to support that. And while we're on the topic of mitochondrial peptides, I just wanted to quickly uh, mention uh, a second mitochondrial peptide we published a few months ago, which is called MOTC. Uh, MOTC is also derived from a mitochondrial chromosome from a different region called the 12S region. It leads to activation of uh, AMPK, pretty dramatic increase in AMPK levels, which leads to, when administered into mice, fed a high-fat diet, to weight loss and insulin sensitization, uh, which we like to think of as exercise mimetic activity because it also increases muscle uh, growth and glucose utilization in muscle. So I'd like to think that if what we really seek is ultimate health and longevity, <clears throat> The solution has to be diet and exercise. And one of the things that we've been working on in recent years is how diet and exercise work. And clearly, both diet and exercise separately affects mitochondrial function. And as we've recently shown, they lead to activation of production of mitochondrial peptides. Uh, in data that I don't have time to show you, we've shown that caloric restriction and fasting lead to increased humanin, and exercise is associated with increased MOTC production and turnover, and they appear to be key signals from the mitochondria that uh, respond to lifestyle that lead to uh, health and longevity. And that, in a sense, summarizes uh, what I believe is the right approach. And I want to thank all of you uh, for coming tonight. I want to congratulate uh, the organizer for a fantastic SP meeting, and to acknowledge uh, my many collaborators uh, and colleagues and funding sources. Thank you.